Hi, I'm Femi O'K. And I'm Malika Bilal. Today, is the Commonwealth relevant? Tell us what you think. Weigh in using the hashtag AJStream or comment in the YouTube chat and you too could be in the stream. That was a 1985 clip of Queen Elizabeth discussing her viewpoint on the Commonwealth of Nations. 33 years later, does the organization still have a purpose? The Commonwealth was formed in 1949 as a loose association of former British colonies. Now, over the years, it's grown to include countries that actually have no ties to the United Kingdom. But these joining nations must agree to the broad principles of the Commonwealth, development, democracy, human rights and peace. This month, the UK will host a gathering of some 53 heads of government representing about a third of the world's population, all of them members of the Commonwealth. But does being a member matter? Well, joining us to discuss this from London, Commonwealth Secretary General Patricia Scotland. In Nottingham, Iftisam Ahmed, a PhD candidate at the University of Nottingham. He's also a coordinator with the Commonwealth Decriminalization Campaign. In Ottawa, Canada, Tim Shaw, a professor and the former director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. And here in our studio is Sean Tharoor. He's a foreign affairs reporter with The Washington Post. Welcome, everyone. So, guess there is a scene in a film called uh, a Monty Python film, and it says, talking about the Roman Empire, what have the Romans ever done for us? And it just occurred to me, what has the Commonwealth ever done for the Commonwealth members? In a sentence, now you don't have to make it a positive sentence, but in a sentence, what would you say, Ishan? It's given us crickets and a platform to be, defeat the British. Professor Tim, <laughs> what has the Commonwealth ever done for Commonwealth members? It, it's obviously advanced the lingua franca of globalization English, but it's also advanced education, health, law, human rights, and diasporic, uh, multiracial, multi-religious communities. Mm -hmm. It's given us a common platform to discuss our grievances, I think, and that's just as vital as the positives, I feel. Secretary General, are you happy with what you've heard so far? Well, I think there's a real understanding that the Commonwealth of 2.4 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30, and who share common language, common law, common uh, approach towards democracy and institutions, have probably more relevance today than we've ever had. And for the reasons given, which are positive, and an opportunity for us to share our grievances mm. as well. Ishan, is this organization, this institution, still relevant? I mean, you cover foreign affairs for the Washington Post. When you're looking at it from your perspective outside of a Commonwealth country, what's relevant? Well, I think it is relevant, as uh, Lady Scotland said, for what it culturally represents. It represents uh, 2.4 billion people. Mm. It represents a shared history of a sort. Uh, and it represents a shared experience of a sort. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the reason why we're really talking about the Commonwealth right now, this year, is that in the shadow of Brexit, it's been taken on a particular political valence in the, in the British conversation. Mm -hmm. You have people who've cheered for Britain's exit from the European Union, uh, talking about reviving the Commonwealth, building an import, Empire 2.0, and the Commonwealth has become the stand-in for Britain's new, I new idea of itself in the world, this, this way of reviving a British project in the world. And that, to me, is interesting and also a bit delusional. Mm. So I think there are a few people, quite a few people online within our community that would agree completely with what you said. I want to share just a couple of those views. This is John on Twitter who says, the Commonwealth is an association of unequals largely neglected for 30 years, useful every four years when Britain wants to bathe in some imperial nostalgia while exercising its sporting prowess. Another person equally as harsh here, Rakesh says, the British put up no Indians or dogs signs at clubs across India. So why are Indians still taking part in things like the Commonwealth Games? The Commonwealth is the only club of victims of colonialism that glorifies their tormentors. Uh, Ibti Sam, I'm wondering if you can relate or understand where people like this are coming from, because we've got quite a few comments that were in the same vein. 
Absolutely. Um, I come from a post-colonial state myself. I come from Bangladesh and uh, I'm a post-colonial scholar. And there's a, a slightly perverse sense of uh, common victimhood that one sees within the membership of the Commonwealth. Uh, I think what needs to be addressed is whether the Commonwealth is actually providing a platform for those kinds of post-colonial and decolonial discussions. And in some angles, perhaps they actually are. Um, and unfortunately, in some angles, they're not. And I think uh, with regards to whether the Commonwealth is relevant or whether it has potential, unfortunately, overall, it might be seen as not having it. But you need to break it down into the nuances of what the individual conversations are, I think. Secretary General, these conversations that you can have, there's a certain awkwardness about the Commonwealth because people don't realise where it came from. It came from the old British Empire and it's an uncomfortable association for many. Well, I, I'm um, really intrigued to hear the perspective that's being given today because I've had the privilege in the last two years of talking to the 53 heads of the Commonwealth who are the democratic representatives of the 2.4 billion people. And they see this in a very different way. And I think everyone has got stuck with the um, construct that's been put on it as a result of Brexit. But I want us to take us out of Brexit and to look at what we decided and what we've done before 2016, 2017, when this became an obsession as to whether the United Kingdom was going to come in or go out. If we look at the reality, in 2015, the Commonwealth came to the decision that they wanted to focus on some clear objectives. And remember, in 2013, the Commonwealth heads of government came together and they agreed upon the Commonwealth Charter, in which our values were inculcated and expressed. And those values are a direct mirror of the UN Sustainable Development Goals that the whole world signed up to in September of 2015, two years later. And that basically demonstrates why the Commonwealth is important. It brings together an eclectic mix of countries, big ones, small ones, mm. uh, large ones, the most um, advantaged and the least advantaged. The biggest is 1.2 uh, billion India. Some of the smallest in the Pacific have only 11,000 people. And that is an extraordinary platform to make decisions. And so I think the Commonwealth has never been more important. In 2015, we discovered there was a 19% trading advantage from countries who traded one with the other within the Commonwealth. And why was that? Because we, have, we speak the same language, we have the same common law, we have the same structure, and that is going to be exploited in a world where protectionism is becoming increasingly important. The Commonwealth is giving every indication that it's anti-protectionism and actually understands that wealth isn't just money, it is our values, it is our, our aspirations and our opportunity to work together as a family. And that has now been clearly demonstrated that that has an economic value. Uh, Commonwealth right. countries are trading more with each other. So I understand that people who are looking at the past see this as a construct which is primarily British. Mm. But I just ask you to remember that there are actually 52 other members and they see yes. this mm. very differently. They're looking uh, forward, not backwards. Tim. And can I reinforce what the Secretary General has said, particularly with small island developing states, particularly for communities uh, around the world? The Commonwealth has facilitated a, a range of migrations and uh, diasporas. And I think the work of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, the Commonwealth Foundation, and particularly given what some of the uh, other discussions have said, the Commonwealth literature uh, and Commonwealth cultures, uh, which you can't really put a value on. Mm, yeah. I think we, and you have I to think... remember that 31 states yes. are small nation states, and there right. are only 39 in the world. And so the Commonwealth is very much the voice of the small state and is able to put on the platform things like climate change. It was the Commonwealth right. in 1989 in the Lakawi conference and uh, who said climate is an existential threat. 
and we need to face it. It was the Commonwealth in 2015, before the Paris Agreement, who said if we want to change uh, climate, if we want to tackle that, then we have to have an enforceable system. We have to have it as two degrees and we have to have it as 1.5. And the important reason why they were able to come to that conclusion is because everybody was represented. Right. All six regions and we were able to be the pathway Secretary General, for others to follow. We have an online community Paris. who also want to talk to you and our guests. Melita. So Secretary General, you mentioned the advantage of the relationship and there's a few people picking up on that. This is Hamlet on Twitter who says Relic of imperial past, yes. Useless, no. It's good for international relations amongst nations. That alone is important, the same way it's important to have friends. But I will say not all members of uh, Commonwealth nations understand what that relationship is really for and if it is valuing them or benefiting them. I want to play a video comment we got from Ronki Lawal. Uh, she's in the UK and she has that question. Have a look. I am a British-born Nigerian woman, so technically I'm a child of the Commonwealth, but I have to admit I'm a little bit sceptical about the Commonwealth. I've never really understood what its purpose is or was, aside from maintaining the relationships with the United, between the United Kingdom and its former colonies. I mean, I've heard some great testimonies from individuals who have been able to travel from different colonies um, around the world, but in terms of Commonwealth, so the uplifting um, of individuals and um, economies around the world are not entirely convinced. So Ishan, her point is the wealth is not so common in this commonwealth. Right. I mean, of course, there's that historical legacy of being the, the creation of an empire that looted your countries or exploited your nations in various ways. But of course, moving beyond that now, a lot of the major countries in the commonwealth have far bigger fish to fry and chips to eat than, uh, than you know, thinking about their role within this particular organization. You look at, at Canada, it's much more interested in, in its dealings with NAFTA, or it's, it's also leading the way, revitalizing TPP. You look at uh, Australia, it has a much more complicated and important relationship with China. You look at India, um, this is the, the great hope of post-Brexit. Post Britain is a free trade deal with India. India's not likely going to give one that's yeah, on favorable terms to the but British. Can I say, you, you really just have to look at the new economics. You will have looked at what's happened on world trade. We had a real slowdown, 2% 2, 2, uh, 2 growth in GDP. It's now gone up to 36 37 why has the countries who have benefited done well? Because they have invested in human capital. What has the Commonwealth been doing? Investing in human capital. We've just issued in 2018, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the new 2018 trade review, which clearly identifies with good empirical data, the benefit that there is in trade. We have a real opportunity to expand it, um, if you look at the growth level, we're going east. The development in the past was in the west. Now it's in the east. And the fact that we share the same common law, common structures, means that the whole Commonwealth, not just the UK, the whole Commonwealth can take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. And you have to remember, we are living in a really changing environment where protectionism is becoming the norm. And it's the Commonwealth countries who are saying we are open to business and what's really interesting is we are more open to each other because we are a family. All right, so and Secretary General, I hear, reasons, I hear this optimistic economic argument for the value of the Commonwealth. Uh, right, right now, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Games are going on. Let me just show you this, this picture here from Perth now. This is Usain Bolt, who obviously is a very well-known athlete. He is there, out there promoting in Australia the Commonwealth Games 2018 but also on the lead up to the Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast in Australia, there were protesters who were upset about being linked as individuals to the Commonwealth. Have a listen to their protest. So basically today what we wanted to do was we wanted to make, the, make it clear to the mob, make it clear to the world, make it clear to our people that we're here and we're, here and we're standing strong. And we don't want nothing. We don't want nothing of the Commonwealth here. They've stolen the land, built this country on stolen wages, built this country on the blood and bones of our people. And it's about time that history is acknowledged and about time them royal families who are, held, who are responsible for it all, they come down here, they get on our level. They ask to be here in our country. 
as on is that. If to some, there are some very real issues that the Commonwealth as a family of countries are having to tackle right now. Um, uh, one of the ones, which is a really big one, is LBTQ rights. How does 50, how do 53 countries even begin to tackle that? And they say we're into development, democracy, human rights and peace. This is our mission. This is our platform. How are they doing? I think with regards to LGBTQ plus rights in particular, it's a very interesting legacy that's been left behind because a vast majority of the countries within the Commonwealth, uh, 37 of them continue to make homosexual intimacy a criminal act. Uh, but the reason they do that is because of a common law that was introduced under British colonialism in 1860. Uh, these are, of course, post-colonial states, and in many cases they are uh, due their own uh, responsibilities to change that. But the global trend of entrenching homophobia can't be ignored either. Mm. Uh, what's been happening uh, with regards to the Commonwealth is uh, a coalition known as the Commonwealth Equality Network, uh, which is a coalition of LGBTQ plus grassroots organizations that are working together. Uh, and they have a really interesting role because on the one hand, uh, many of these groups are illegal in their own jurisdictions. They're illegal in their own home countries. Uh, they often have to act in anonymity and through discretion. But what they also don't want is a case of countries like the UK, where being homosexual is no longer a criminal offence. What they don't want is those countries to come in and kind of swoop in and save them. That's not the role of the Commonwealth, and that shouldn't be the role of the Commonwealth. Uh, what the uh, Equality Network really is doing is providing a platform for these individuals and these groups to speak up, not as victims and not as uh, people who are being uh, ab abused and exploited by a historic relic, but as individuals with agency and nuance. And mm. that is something that I think the Commonwealth can provide a really powerful platform for. Uh, and and, and can I think I, if we just, re yes. And I just reinforce this. I was proud to be part of the Commonwealth uh, Chogham in, in both uh, Trinidad and in Uganda. And in the side uh, of those discussions, particularly around the Commonwealth Foundation, there were indeed uh, important discussions about these very issues of sexual orientation. And I think the Commonwealth has likewise played an important role in terms of putting issues of religion and fundamentalisms and socialization on the agenda through its human rights uh, and, and law uh, and, and gender connections. We haven't yet mentioned, although obviously we're pleased to have the first female Secretary General, the Commonwealth has also been in the avant-garde in terms of women's issues. Ishan. I think, uh, I think that, sorry, uh, I just want to add though that I think it's very vital to take the Equality Network as a very important model for these discussions because what the, what the Equality Network allows for is uh, a, plural, uh, a pluralism and uh, a multitude of contexts. And sometimes that's left out, even in the economic discussion, uh, although there is a lot of development, that isn't uh, universal across the Commonwealth. And there's a danger perhaps in saying a success and saying, that's across all 53 countries. That's not the case. And uh, we would be very, very uh, remiss to think of it that way as well. So we need to remind ourselves of the context and we need to remind ourselves of the pluralism that's at stake here. To, to just jump in for a second. I think that the Commonwealth has an incredibly powerful and important story to tell. Yeah. As some of the commenters have been saying, though, uh, there is in Britain and elsewhere, I mean, particularly in Britain, a lack of full understanding of the imperial past. There's been a lack of in reckoning Britain, in Britain. There's a lack of understanding. Right. And because what you, how? How would you explain well, I mean, I, that? I, you, this has been a discussion of a pretty hot topic of late, that there is an inadequate understanding of um, what Britain has done in, in its past. And I think the Commonwealth could be a great vehicle of education, of information, of, mm -hmm. of redressing, of changing the narrative. And, and by doing so, better integrating these, these countries. Yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned that. I, I want to bring this in uh, live on YouTube. Uh, Ikoko says, please, I need this question to be answered. If a great majority of the Commonwealth were developed, would the nature of the organization be the same? So that's a question that's sort of answered online already. Uh, Hafsa here on Twitter says that the Commonwealth is a gentler way of holding on to the empire that was, letting the world know those countries gained something from Britain. But one of the benefits for Commonwealth countries is the boost they get in the education and humanitarian mm -hmm. sectors. We actually heard from someone who specifically spoke to us about that boost. We got a video comment um, from Harry Pinda, and he explains how it's benefited him. 
Of course, the Commonwealth's history isn't very good and we know that the Commonwealth history was based on colonialism. But I think it's important for us to, to use those, those links that have, that have created all these countries all across the world and actually how they can be a powerhouse for change. And I think it's important that we don't necessarily just get rid of this concept because of its history, but actually use it as a powerful tool to develop the world. So Tim, he sees it hey. as a powerful tool. What do you make of that? If, if I may just uh, indicate it, it's in, indicative that there are still countries lining up to join the Commonwealth. Uh, and I think the Commonwealth has played an important role in terms of bringing indigenous communities, Canada, Australia, India, etc., together. Um, these are things that the United Nations, the EU and other communities uh, play a much less creative and important role compared to the Commonwealth's. Mm. Secretary General, I just want to play this to you. This is the, in the, the 1980s, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher at the time explained how important the Queen is to the Commonwealth. Have a listen to what she said back then. The interesting thing is, as we have a Commonwealth conference, the Queen actually does not attend either the opening or any sessions. And yet she is very much there because the most important thing to many of the representatives here is the audience which each of them goes and has with the Queen during the course of the conference. And the most important event is when we all get together when the Queen gives uh, a dinner in honour of all heads of government. And I think um, without that, a close link with her without the feeling that when each prime minister or president goes into the Queen that she knows their problems has known them over many many years that she's interested that she knows them not only their national problems she knows them in relation to those in other countries of the Commonwealth. Secretary General I'm just looking here on your Twitter feed and you retweeted the royal family and this is you meeting the Queen with a corgi how invested is she still right now in the Commonwealth? What does she tell you? I think Her Majesty um, loves the Commonwealth, and that's uh, uh, the biggest uh, unkept secret in the world. And her dedication over the last 60 years has been quite remarkable. And you have to remember that Her Majesty was a young queen and was perhaps one of the first um, uh, demonstrations of a young woman leader. And people forget that that been so for the last 60 years and she's been a real exemplar because if you look at what happened over apartheid in South Africa, um, Her Majesty was very much the Queen of the whole Commonwealth and not just the Queen of the United Kingdom. Mm. All right, so and this is this... Fact this is what I'm wondering, and Tim, you, you, can, you can chime in here. So the Queen is very invested. She's been very invested in Commonwealth for a very long time. Who becomes the next head of the Commonwealth? That is an interesting question, is it not, Tim? Who would be next? Yes, but, uh, and, and I was going to say that she actually became Queen when she was in Kenya. So uh, all sorts of Commonwealth connections. The Commonwealth uh, has its own structures, both intergovernmental and non-governmental. Uh, and I wouldn't venture to... This is uh, Tim avoiding the question. The Secretary, Secretary General, yes. Secretary General, who could be the next head of the Commonwealth? Could it be one of the Commonwealth countries? Does it have to be a member of the royal family? The decision is made by the 53 heads of the Commonwealth, oh. and it's their decision. Interesting. Malika? So Douglas on Twitter says, the Commonwealth has the ability to reinvent itself to reflect a changing world. Ishan, do you think that a reinvention is what's needed here or a scrapping of the whole thing? Certainly, I think a reinvention would be fascinating. I think it's a, there's no need to scrap the Commonwealth. It's an important historic institution. But to reflect its current moment, uh, it would be fascinating to see it be decentralized from Britain, see an operation, see a headquarters in Lagos or Delhi or Accra or wherever, and, a headquarters uh, in Lagos. Now that would yeah. be interesting. And, and, Never a dull moment. And, you know, if, if this is about 2.4 billion people, shift the center of gravity east or yeah. south or yeah. places to places that are part of the as much part of the global conversation as Britain is, sure. if not more so now. Uh, and that would be a great reflection of the 21st century. Wow. I have to say thank you to Ishan, to Professor Timothy Shaw, to Ibtishan Ahmed, and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Patricia Scotland. It's been a pleasure. Just talking about such an old institution and where might it go next? The conversation continues online at hashtag AJStream. Thanks for watching. Take care, everybody.